When Bram Stoker's Dracula was originally published, it featured themes of death, seduction, temptation, and eternal life. And something about the arrangement of those themes produced a story that was horrifying to its Victorian audience. But vampire stories, mostly in movie form today, don't feature among some of the scariest and most terrifying stories that we can think of. Vampires today are just as often depicted as our friends than they are our adversaries. Sometimes the worst thing that they can do to you is just kill you, which doesn't make them any worse than any human adversary. The worst versions we have of them today makes them no worse than serial killers, which I suppose is bad enough, but it doesn't produce the kind of uncanny terror and dread that other concepts can. So why is it that vampire stories, and especially the original vampire story, have lost their ability to terrify us the way that they once did? What is it about us that has changed so dramatically that this story no longer produces the same terror and dread that it once did? When Bram Stoker's Dracula was originally published, you could still expect that most people reading it in the English world were influenced by some form of Christianity, which impressed upon them the idea that the hopes of this life are of no avail, but that we should put our faith and our hope in the eternal life that has been won for us through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus said things like, we shouldn't be afraid of whoever can kill the body but not kill the soul. Instead, we should be afraid of the one who can kill the body and the soul in hell. He also said things like, whoever tries to save their life will lose it and whoever tries to, whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. In other words, our priority should be on the big picture. We should be in this thing for the long haul. And if we become too preoccupied with the short trial run we get in this mortal life, we can endanger our eternal life. The solution, of course, according to the Christian formula, is that we should put our trust and our faith in Jesus who offers us true eternal life. And not just the kind of life that persists on and on, but one that is characterized by health, happiness, love, satisfaction. It's, it's the kind of life that you'll want to have. And if you can accept that, then it can be a great source of consolation and hope. It makes the difficulties and the suffering of this life not only worth it, but in some ways kind of insignificant. It gives us the strength to endure the hardships of this life without grasping at what little it has to offer in desperation as if that's all that matters. And if those themes and ideas would be influential for you, then the transaction that the Victorian vampire offers you would be terrifying because it's a perversion of the same thing that Jesus Christ offers. Dracula isn't the author of life, so he can't give what he doesn't have. And that's the nature of evil itself. It, it doesn't have any power or substance of its own. It's, it's parasitic in nature. It relies on what is good and then it creates some sort of distortion or perversion of the good. Dracula is a derivative perversion of the Christ. He's an anti-Christ figure. And yes, he can kill your body, but he can also damn you to eternal life, but it's a cursed life without love, friendship, without any appreciation for whatever is good that can be attained in this life. It's incessant living without hope. And what could be more terrifying to the mind of a person who has found a hope, a true hope of eternal life, only to have that hope snatched and replaced with a terrifying alternative uh, everlasting existence. Another interesting parallel between Christ and Dracula is the means by which the eternal life that they offer is transmitted. In the case of Dracula, he feeds off of you. He steals your vitality and then replaces it with a macabre substitute of an existence that is a living death. In the case of Jesus, it's reversed. He, he gives us life because he is the author of life. We consume his body and blood, that is his physical life, in order that we could have eternal life. He pours out his life so that we may live. Dracula became a new presentation of what has been a long theme in Christian civilization, the cautionary tale of making a pact with the devil, which is a cultural motif that goes all the way back to the story of Dr. Faust. What makes the deal with the devil motif so compelling and even seductive is the temptation of having our reward now on our own terms, or at least apart from God's terms. It means never having to traverse the, the veil of death and to pick up our own cross and suffer in imitation of Jesus, but instead accessing and receiving our reward now without going through any of that. But both Faust and Dracula are cautionary because they reveal to us the price of that transaction. 
In the case of Dracula, it is a cursed existence as an aberrant figment of what it means to be human. It is persistence without hope. In other words, it's damnation made manifest in the character of Dracula, as well as his victims. And a Christian should find that prospect and that cost repellent and horrific, which is why that story was so effective when it was first published. But as the influence of Christianity has waned, so too has our attentiveness to the weight and significance of our immortal souls and our immortal life. We become more preoccupied with this life and again, what little it has to offer us. And even with our grasping at it, we find that we're barely able to hold on to it. As C.S. Lewis said, aim for heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you will get neither. We've become more reliant on this life to fulfill our hopes. Without the hope of eternal life, we are far more persuaded by whatever alternative options might be offered to us. And with that, the seduction of the vampire becomes much less a temptation as it is a desperate plea from us to save us from death on whatever terms are offered. With that pervading attitude, the story of the vampire mutates from a cautionary tale about holding out for the treasures of heaven to a compromise about the only ha hope we have for eternal life being here and now, even if it does come with some some pesky trade-offs. The vampire transforms from a seductive figure capable of robbing us from the greatest gift that has been offered to us to someone who can just give us exactly what we want because we become so conditioned by material temptations that we no longer recognize them as temptations. And because we are so desensitized, we become too stupid to recognize that this is what we should truly be afraid of, even going so far as to mistake it for an ally or a friend. Thanks for watching. The reason I can continue making content like this is because of the generous support of my viewers. If you feel called to support this work, then consider joining the Reinforcements, which is my online community. There are multiple tiers, including free access for those who can't help financially but still want to join. You can join up at www.brianholtworth.ca. Certain levels will also get a free gift basket from Glory and Shine, who is a family-owned Catholic bath and body products company whose beard balm I'm wearing right now. It's like aromatherapy for your face. Even if you don't join, they make amazing products. So check them out at gloryandshine.com. And don't forget to like and subscribe. You don't have to agree with everything I said to get value out of these kinds of conversations. So be sure to subscribe to be edified or challenged. There's value in both.